so here's what we're going to do today. Uh, I'm John. Well, no, I always forget to do these things. It's like week three. So I mean, this is rhetoric, modern rhetorical theory. How many rhetoric people do we have? Oh, a lot. Oh, well, that's shocking. Um, well, that completely changes my lecture for today. <laughs> so, um, so what I'm going to do tonight is uh, probably talk for about 45 minutes or so about um, what theory is. Um, and I'm going to talk about, I mean, rhetoric is in a weird situation, a weird institutional situation, um, which makes it a little bit more problematic. I mean, I would say, for instance, the title of this class is Modern Rhetorical Theory, right? For those who don't know. And uh, there's this kind of vague, ambiguous way in which I sort of understand what that calls for, right? I just, kind of sense of what modern rhetorical theory is supposed to be, and again, it's vague. But, um, but if I actually pay attention to each of those words, I find that I don't actually know what any of them are. You know? um, and so, modern, for instance. Like, I don't know if that refers to, I'll take two very different, totally conventional understandings of that word. One is beginning in the 16th century, and one is beginning in the 20th century. Those are really different, <laughs> I mean, and those are totally conventionalized. Those aren't like bizarre, weird theory guy type stuff, right? So, I mean, even at that level, the word modern is unclear to me. The word rhetorical, for reasons that we'll talk about later, is unclear to me. But what I'm going to talk about for most of tonight is theory. Um, and let me say, I mean, maybe I should. There's a button over there. A white one. Color would be good for tonight. Black is the color of theory. <laughs> so, I mean, this is just to, to get a, a, a beginning handle. Is it is it a methodological assignment? What I'll start with is. Uh, make a distinction between what I'm calling like the vague common usage of a term, right? So that sense in which like I kind of know what modern rhetorical theory is about, but with any kind of precision, it's like it becomes difficult to delineate exactly what it means, okay? And this distinction between the kind of vague common usage of terms and the precise uh, 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 um, articulation of any particular term will be very important. I mean, I want to hang on to that distinction because I, I think it's important to have both, right? You have both the kind of I will talk frequently, and tonight especially, about what people in English departments tend to mean when they mean theory. What people in rhetorical studies tend to mean when they say the word theory. This is that sort of vague common usage sense. Uh, at the same time, there are very precise lineages to what one means by, for instance, a term like critical theory. You guys have heard the word critical theory. That's a term that gets used interchangeably with theory writ large. But it also refers to a very particular Frankfurt School version of theory practiced by Adorno and Horkheimer. And so like the term critical theory itself oscillates in this, between this kind of vague common usage and uh, a kind of precise delineation. Do you want to uh, sell this? Sorry, I'll take two. Did you get my email? I told you it was well. I'm going to try to slip in with that, you know. Ah. <coughs> um, I think there's a value to each of these things, and I'm not going to say that one is better than the other. Um, but I am going to encourage you to attend to these, these different dimensions. I mean, just to take a commonplace example, like uh, in, uh, the word think. Okay? I mean, I just used it. I just said it. I think there's a value to both of these. What did I mean by the word think there? Something like belief, right? Something. But, uh, it, it, like, when someone says, what did you think about last week's Game of Thrones? What are they asking for? Judgment. Yeah, they're asking for an evaluation or some kind of judgment. So the word think there means something different than it meant in this context. Or when Aretha Franklin says, you better think, think, think about what you're trying to do to me. What does she mean there? Reconsider. 
Yeah, like pay a little more heightened attention to what you're doing, okay? So, all right, in, in that case, I mean, this is three sort of different vague common usages of the term thing. But for instance, in philosophy theory world, there are very precise understandings of it as well. So for instance, the word think in Descartes' cogito, I think therefore that I am, is the end point of a reduction, a, a movement that through which subjectivity, the I think, grounds ontology, the I am, or being. Right? Or conversely, thinking for someone like Heidegger, Was heißt Denken, is an essay, that, and by the way, like the Cartesian, I mean, this is the basis, the philosophical basis for mind-body dualism. But Heidegger, several hundred years later, writes about thinking as what thinking is, is precisely a kind of overcoming of that subject-object dualism initiated with Descartes. So what I want to point out here is the word think operates in multiple registers. The word think has, has precise lineages, it has precise traditions. And the more familiar you can become with the diverse arena of them, the, the, and this is also why it's not simply better to have simply the precise definitions, because when somebody, when somebody says, what did you think about the Game of Thrones, you'd be like, do you mean in the Heideggerian sense? <laughs> you know? um, so having that sort of common usage of how people generally understand things uh, is, is productive and useful uh, as well, I think. <laughs> A good example of this in the field of rhetoric, and the most commonplace example is the word that's translated as art. The art of rhetoric, you find that phrase all over the place in terms of talking about rhetoric. The word that's translated from the Greek, art, is techne. Right? Techne translated as art. That's a kind of odd shift, right? Techne means it's the root of technology. Do we think of technology as being artistic? Like art tends to have this contemporary sense of imaginative and creative. That's a different sense of art than antiquity had. So in the case of techne, art actually means something much more like method. Right? Rather than art, I mean, we tend to juxtapose method is this kind of rigorous step-by-step -step process. Art is the thing that doesn't have a rigorous step-by-step -step process that just happens. And so in a certain sense, I mean, this is this, the common example in rhetoric is that the vague understanding of the term art, but also the very precise understanding. So if, if you read Aristotle as calling uh, rhetoric, or calling rhetoric an art, he means something very different than you sort of vaguely think in your common usage understanding. And as I said, I mean, things like, you know, the word theory, the word feminism, the word deconstruction, right? most of the time that these things are used, especially conversationally and in classrooms, it's extremely imprecise. Right? And that's fine, but I want to, I'm going to encourage you to attend to more precisely uh, to particular concepts and their lineages, the multiple lineages out of which they come. So let's go to the word theory. And let me say the way that I'm framing this what I'm doing here tonight is, is really around like theory in English departments. I will address later and indirectly specifically rhetorical theory, like what that, will, what that little specificity of the word rhetorical will mean, and also the word modern. Um, but right now, what I'm going to be talking about generally is theory in English departments. In other words, a lot of it is literary theory, or literary theory that became cultural theory. Uh, as we'll talk about. So this is kind of an introduction to theory from an English department -y style. I mean, we're in an English department, so it's not that crazy. Um, but I think that the story is not terribly dissimilar in most humanities uh, uh, over the last roughly 40 years. Um, but there will be particular characters and particular uh, per the particularities that will uh, that will change. So, so to the word theory. Let's start with the extra academic usage. When somebody says, uh, you know, in theory you shouldn't have to teach while you're in a PhD program, what do they mean? Ideally. Ideally, in a perfect world. So there's a sense of theory being somehow not real, right? 
not practical. Uh, how else does the word theory get used? I have a theory. Now, what does it mean to call it a theory rather than something else? What does it mean to call evolution a theory? <laughs> That's a very precise meaning, too, John. <laughs> well, like, well it, it means a, what is the particular thing? It's a systematic explanation of various phenomena that has been thus verified by phenomena. So it's, it's, a, it's an educated guess, is a good word. But not as a theory, it's not fact. I mean, as a theory, right, right. it is not yet, in other words, as a theory, it is subject to testing in a particular scientific milieu. And this is the argument that you will often hear in terms of evolution, is that it's not really a theory, because it can't be tested, right? It's an explanation of a certain kind, but it's not a very, it's not precisely a theory. But nevertheless, in common usage, people, I mean, this is outside of academia, people will call evolution a theory, and they'll do that precisely to say, it's not yet true. The theory of evolution. Or, well, that's Mucklebauer's theory of theories. Right? You say that precisely in order to say, well, that's just one guy's idiosyncratic thing. That's not what theories really are. And this, by the way, is an idiosyncratic theory of theories. Um, all right, turning away from the, the common usage to the way that it gets used in the academy, the first one, the first usage of the word theory that I want to model is that it refers very generally, this is, suck your ass. Is it really I have a better one. Here's black one. Oh, someone's going to become the pen person. All right, instant. Thank you. You have to choose an unstinky one. Oh, look at that. I mean, that's just kind of refreshing, isn't it? <laughs> OK. This is, this is the theory conversation. So uh, what, what do people in academia mean when they say it's theory? that you're working with theory. Well, I'll parse out a couple senses of this, I think. Um, one is that really vaguely, that means that you're trafficking in stuff that's hard to understand. I think this is the most common usage of the term theory in humanities. Is that they, what they mean by that is not it's imaginary or that it's like, I don't really get it. Well, that's theory. I do theory. You wouldn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's the really smart, difficult stuff. Um, and I really, I mean, honestly, I think that probably is the most common way that the, the term gets mobilized. Um, the second way is that it's used to uh, refer to a collection of efforts over the last 30 to 40 years to problematize the traditional methods of doing humanistic scholarship. Um, if you don't know already, theory is probably one of the most polarizing words in English departments. Um, I've often said it's like, I think the word Derrida is the, is the one <laughs> word in English departments that everybody has an opinion about, right? Nobody's like, eh, you know, whatever. You know, but, but theory more generally, he's the synecdoche for theory uh, in this case. But um, theory more generally has been quite polarizing in English departments, in, in, in large part because people use it to refer to this collection of efforts over the last 40 years that looks for some as an attempt to sort of make it difficult to do the kind of work we used to do when we wanted to do real literary scholarship. So that's the sense in which one's relation, in an English department, one's, one's relationship to theory is not one thing among others in the way that the difference between you being a 19th centuryist or an 18th centuryist, these are just sort of different fields. The relationship to theory is distinctive in that regard. Being pro-theory or anti-theory or sort of theory or what kind of theory. Um, there's a positive side of that too, right? Which is that, that positively, theory is the, the thing that usurped all the power from the pompous old white guys, right? And, and uh, allowed it to uh, distribute itself a little bit more. So it's not simply a negative. It needn't simply be thought of as negative. Because, of course, the negative version is like, well, as a result of theory, uh, people teach Chris Farley movies and not Shakespeare. And that's, we all know, fucked up. Oh, I should say, I use profanity in class with regularity. And I always get in trouble for it, so I'm telling you in advance that that's going to happen, and if you're uncomfortable with it, then fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's just not good. Oh, good. This is it. You're going to make sure you got that one. Oh, I got it. Right? 
efforts to problematize traditional models of scholarship. Um, they often don't make a distinction between theory and cultural studies, for instance. And in, and in a precise sense, there's plenty of folks who do cultural studies work who are actively anti-theory. You know, so so it, 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 uh, it tends to treat all things non-traditional as being therefore theory, or theoretical in some way. Um, okay, in the third meaning, which I think is, the, is uh, extremely important, this is the more conceptual meaning, is the distinction between theory and practice. This comes from a more scientific use, uh, sense of the term. In this sense, we really should represent it more adequately. In this sense, theory refers to a set of kind of generalized attributes extracted from practice on the one hand. So it has both an inductive and deductive relationship. So right now that's the inductive, inductive relationship. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the idea being, I'm going to take a whole bunch of texts written in the 1920s, and I'm going to read them. And from those, I'm going to diagnose a series of common attributes. And from that, I'm going to have a theory of 1920s writing. Right? So I'm abstracting to a level of generality from a whole series of particulars. Or you could go the other way. Okay. Theory that informs the practice. I'm going to do a Marxist reading of X. X being the practice, theory being the generalized conceptual uh, matrix. So the important point here is in this understanding, theory is in transcendent relationship to practice. In theory, we would be, right? In other words, it is not real. Well, that's not fair. It is not on the same level as practice. It is in a generalized transcendent. It is above practice. Does that make sense? I think that this sense of theory, it, it, it circulates through the others that we've mentioned. It's, these are not like rigidly distinct understandings of theory. But I think this is a very, very common one. And I think it's one of the hardest ones to really overcome because we do have this, this distinction between theory and practice. Which, by the way, it's, it's interesting to think about this, and we'll talk about this in a bit, but in terms of rhetoric, the problem of the relation between theory and practice is quite different than it is in most of English departments. Not least of which because rhetoric doesn't have texts in the same way that literary studies has texts at all. Right? Just curious. Um, okay. Those are the common, I think, the common English department understandings of theory. And like I said, I, I parse them out as three different ones, but they're definitely related. I want to give you a, another understanding, which is my understanding, which is a kind of materialist, Foucauldian spiced version of theory. And let me also say, people that work under the name of theory work in these models as well. It's not like I'm giving you the real version of theory. Um, so it's, I think I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to give you what is a more productive way of thinking about what theory does. And to think of the theorists that we read as doing this kind of thing. So, here's my definition. And I wrote this down because I wanted to say it right. So that means that I'm capable of repeating this. Theory is involved. That's already weak. Theory is involved. <laughs> That's just a lame definition. Sorry to pass the voice. Theory is involved in the practice of rendering visible or making apparent the constellation of concepts that constitute any action. Constellation of concepts that kind of, come on, you're down with the alliteration. <laughs> That's a look of like, I hate you right now. <laughs> theory is involved in the practice of rendering visible the constellation of concepts that constitute any action. I mean, this, it comes from the Greek, theorisai, which means to make visible. So I'm not simply making this up. To render visible the constellation of concepts that constitute any action. So, and I always, get, I always take this example first because we've all just participated in it. Let's take a very simple action. 
I walked into this class, I handed out the syllabus, you all took it and read it, and never thought anything strange or unusual about that. Uh, my argument would be that action, like any action, is informed by a constellation of concepts. Let's begin to enumerate some of those concepts. What are the concepts that enable the practice of me handing out a syllabus at the beginning of class to seem completely normal and natural and something that you don't go, what the hell is this thing that you passed around? <laughs> what, is, what are some of the concepts that enable that? Yeah. That any course will have a plan by which it will be dictated? OK, good. The very simple, the idea that there's going to be an advanced plan. Uh, and, and let's go further than that. That advanced planning is useful for learning. Because you could make the opposite argument. And I do, frequently, for those who take the class. <laughs> but nevertheless, that there's some, yeah, that there's the advanced, that there should be advanced planning, and that that's somehow going to be more conducive to learning. Which is, this is the thing that's always like, so as, as long as you know what we're reading in November, things will be fine next week. <laughs> like, it, it doesn't really make all that much sense. But nevertheless, there is also, let's be fair, there's also this kind of contractual relation where it's like, I'm giving you a sense that I'm not just going to idiosyncratically do whatever the hell I want. Which, by the way, I don't need to finish this sentence. So, okay. So that's one. Advanced planning. What else? Prognosticate. I, that's how I think of it as probably like, I am telling the future when I make up a syllabus. It's fun. What else? Space. A place where we can all meet and we can pass out a syllabus. Good. I mean, the idea, and this is one that has certainly been challenged in terms of online education, but the idea that us coming together in a particular physical location is going to be most conducive for a certain kind of learning. Also, the very simple idea that you should read stuff. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, many of these things are so obvious that you never ask questions about them. But, and let's also say something like, for instance, I'm looking forward to the day when I walk into my class and students hand out a syllabus. <laughs> that doesn't happen very often. Why not? Because it's a one-way street. Yeah. It's a one-way street, right? So here we also have the presence of institutional power, right? Which I have and you don't. And it says one of my, one of my jobs or privileges, however you want to think about it, is to come in here and tell you what to do. And you can pay for that. <laughs> right? Um, and to pick the particular things, rather this thing rather than another thing, and that presumably I'm doing it, what? With a good intent in mind, <laughs> or something, so that I believe that it will facilitate your learning, which this is another word, I don't even know what that means, right? Like learning? Like what does it mean? We have to write these learning outcomes, which I haven't done for this class <laughs> Learning outcomes that you guys have to do for all your class, like, I don't even understand that. Like, my answer is, they will be different at the end of the semester than they are now. I have no idea how. You know, of course, one has to be a little bit more responsible than that, but I'm not sure why. Um, okay, so what we've just done right there is we've begun to theorize syllabus. Right, we're saying this very simple action, there's a whole lot of what we could call assumptions, I call concepts, that circulate through this very simple action that enable it. And that enable you to never go, huh, that was weird, <laughs> you know, or to, to not question it. Right? And so I would say in that sense, there is a theory, we all hold implicit theories of syllabi. And now what we are theorizing when we begin to render those theories visible. We begin to make them apparent. We talk about them, like we just did very briefly with a silly example. Did you just slip in the rendering practices visible? What's that? Did you say rendering practices? Rendering the concepts that constitute practice is visible, although that distinction would be one that I could, you could conflate. Yeah. Because that's what I want to say. I want to say theory is the practice of rendering practices visible. So I want to, you know, I want to try to flatten this out. Right. It is not, theory is not in meta relation or some transcendent relation to practice. Is it, it is itself another practice. Um, and so this, this idea that, you know, all practices, that theory circulate through all practices, this is this is what informs the position that says uh, one can never be outside of theory. Right? 
So this is the, the famous John Maynard Keynes, Nobel Prize winning economist. I always do this thing when it's like, I'm not making this shit up. This is an actual scholar who, uh, <laughs> who, who forwarded this. Uh, so John, Maynard, I mean, he won a Nobel Prize, and he's an economist, so we can trust him. Right? And, and his famous line was, uh, to be in the grip of, or to be opposed to theory means merely to be in the grip of a different theory. Right? The, the anti-theory position is not actually anti-theory. It just has a different theory, and it disagrees with this theory. So one doesn't ever get to be anti-theory. One is always immersed in what I'm following Deleuze and Foucault would call concepts. Practices are immersed in concepts and constituted by. So that's not a very interesting example. Let's take a better example. So when you teach your students in your first year, first year English class to uh, rhetorically analyze the letter from Birmingham Jail, and this is just something that everybody does, right? Uh, the letter from Birmingham Jail, Martin Luther King, uh, by looking at ethos, pathos, and logos, that's a practice. You're doing something, okay? What are some of the assumptions? What is, what is the theory? Or what are some aspects of the theory that circulate through that? All text will contain rhetorical appeals. What's that? All text will. Are you saying all text? Or are you saying something specific about Martin Luther King's? In other words, do we do this with People Magazine articles? Some people do. Some people do. No, some people do. <laughs> um, less common. I think to a certain extent, when we do it with something like Letter from Birmingham Jail, we're saying there's something kind of special about this that, that warrants being treated in a somewhat different way than one treats most language. Right? So I mean, that's, that's a, first, I mean, a first move. Now, one can problematize that, of course. Um, what else? Ethos, pathos, you guys know these terms. I'm assuming. We can talk about argumentation. Meaning what? Uh, well, uh, how, how an argument is put together, uh, the, uh, the theory of uh, what an audience is. OK. I'll connect it to the learning element of that, is the idea that by making explicit how an argument is constructed, that somebody somehow learns to do it better, which, as any teacher knows, is a questionable assumption at best. Right? It's like, well, I can show you how an argument is constructed, so you magically now are able to construct an argument. Well, no, it doesn't actually work that way. But that is part of the theory. Part of the theory is, if you are capable of understanding how this argument is constructed, that's going to make you better at constructing your own. Right? Yeah, what else? That uh, using all three in the same uh, argument is going to make that argument better. Good. Yes, having all the components of all of Aristotle's artistic proofs is better than two, right? Sure. Also, that one should be one can best attend to this text by reading the text closely. In other words, by looking at the formal features of the text, not, for instance, by listening to it. Listening to it. Finding out reactions. Finding out how it was received. I mean, there's a whole plethora of other ways that one could imagine, you know, deploying this text. But, and again, it's not to say that one is right or one is wrong, but what we're saying is this very simple practice that most teachers would do in 101 without ever thinking twice about it, you know, uh, or 102, I guess, um, is, is, a, is comprised of a complex a constellation of concepts, and that theorizing that renders those concepts visible. So, the crucial question about theory then, if that's what theory does, why do that? <laughs> why do it? I mean, it's incredibly inefficient. That's one real...